Welcome. I want to thank all of you for being here today for the eighth annual Innovation Beehive Collegian Showcase. Uh, I'm Brad Gleason. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurial Operations for Gannon University. And today, um, this is an event put on by the Northwest Pennsylvania Innovation Beehive. Uh, to get things kicked off, I think I first want to recognize the beehive. Uh, I'll start with Gannon University has Kathy Roach as part of our beehive. Hello, Kathy. Uh, Jacob Marsh from Penn State Barron. Hello, Jake. Uh, Abby Lesniewski and Brian Fuller from Mercer University. Uh, Patrick Moran from Erie County. And Chris Leighton and Tony Perinell from Edinburgh University. That makes up our beehive, and they're a very dedicated group that meets weekly to address small business challenges in our community. Additionally, I'd like to recognize that today we have four teams competing for prizes and position in our eighth annual event. And to recognize them, let me say their names. Uh, Auto Shoe Sanitizer from Edinburgh University. Crowd In from Mercyhurst University. Um, additive Manufacturing Systems from Penn State Barron. And Damper from Gannon University. We're very fortunate to be able to get these teams together and to have an esteemed group of judges uh, scoring their performance today. So let me recognize the judges that we have here. First of all, with Karen Respecki, she's CEO of Mason Jars and Marketplace, Inc. The second judge, Kathleen Easterly, Erie Director of Bridgeway Capital. Uh, attorney John DeSilva, who will be with us remotely. Hi, John. Uh, he's founder of MMI Intellectual Properties. Jennifer Hoffman, she's business development officer at the city of Erie. And then Brian McCorkle, transformational innovation leader at Erie Insurance Group. I'm gonna move on to introduce our MC for tonight's event. Uh, we have Brian Slaylin with us, who is the Ben Franklin Technology Partners Portfolio Manager uh, in Erie County. Um, he has been a tireless worker for small business with the drive of saying no wrong door approach for collaborating with dozens of economic development partners like Northwest Innovation Beehive and supportive of thousand companies uh, over the, its tenure, helping creating tens of thousands of jobs uh, throughout the Commonwealth. For the past 10 years, uh, Ben Franklin has been working with entrepreneurial organizations and communities. Brian and Ben Franklin have moved the needle in Northwest Pennsylvania on behalf of small business to the tune of millions and millions of dollars and over hundreds of startups and technology businesses. Um, simply put, our partner at Ben Franklin continue to drive economics uh, in numerous ways through inclusion and to grow burgeoning business into a larger ecosystem. Please join me in welcoming Brian Slaywin as our MC for this evening. That was very nice. Okay. Okay. That was, that was very nice. Yeah, um, I'm super psyched, as is usually the case, when I'm around entrepreneurs and people doing super interesting things, especially in the innovation space. So I look out on, the, on all of you gathered here, and it's really exciting to, to look at the future of what our great community is going to be, and you're all right in the middle of the heart of all that. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for allowing me to to be here, and it's a real honor and a real pleasure to introduce to you a, a gentleman who um, is really pushing hard on making Erie a community of choice, a place where young people can come with their ideas and come with their passion and come with their grit and know that they'll be surrounded by great entrepreneurial uh, supporters and an ecosystem that will help them grow. So if you all will please welcome the mayor of the city of Erie, Mr. Joe Schember. Thank you very much, Brian, and, and thank you, Brad, for inviting me to be here. I do appreciate it. This is, this is very, very exciting. Uh, 
the eighth annual. I think this is the first one I've been at, though. So I've missed seven, but I, I hope not to miss another one going forward. This is, this is really important. You know, if you think back to the late 1800s, when cars were just being invented. Now we take cars for granted, but you know, that, that was transformational. And there's a lot of things going on now that are very transformational as well. Uh, I think in another 10 or 15 years, we'll probably all be driving only electric cars. You know, we'll, we'll eliminate the need for gasoline and oil and, and that, that sort of thing. So it's, it's really exciting what your four teams are working on. And uh, we, I really, really appreciate what you're doing. And I, I really hope you're all going to win something tonight. Uh, and I can't predict who's going to be first, who's going to be fourth. But uh, please, enjoy the evening. Learn from each other as much as you can. It's, I'm very happy that we have a, a group of representatives from each of our four area universities. Uh, I'm a Gannon graduate. I married a Mercyhurst graduate <laughs> about 42 years ago. And uh, you know, we're just, we're so lucky here in the Erie area to have four quality universities here. And uh, one of the things I'd like to do as mayor, if, if you don't mind me saying this, is I'd like to keep as many of you living and working in Erie as possible going forward. You know, Erie uh, had about 40,000 more people about 50 years ago. That's when I was a kid. I was about 19 years old, growing up here in Erie. And uh, 12th Street was totally different than it is today. Back then, you could go down 12th Street in Erie and get five good job office, offers. My first real job, I was 19 years old. I got a job on 12th Street. It was the summer after my junior year of college. And I earned enough money in that one summer to pay for my fall and spring semesters at Gannon. And I enjoyed the job so much, made such good friends, that I stayed on part-time when I went back to school as well. Now, that kind of job doesn't even exist anymore. I was a chipper. They would forge aluminum castings. I would chip the excess aluminum off of them. And then it would go on to the next guy. And I became friends with the people I, I worked with. We'd get together on the weekends and play cards and do things. So, th but things have totally changed. And your four groups, with what you're working on, you're going to help us to bring the jobs of the future here to Erie, which, which we need. I've set a goal for Erie, and my team was a little not sure that we should say this goal out loud, but I've been saying it as much as I can. Over the next seven years, I want to bring at least 10,000 more people to Erie so that we get up well over 100,000 again, because that makes a difference in terms of federal funding and everything else. So uh, good luck to all four teams tonight. I'm sorry I can't stay and watch the outcome of this, but I'm honored to be with you and keep up the great work. Thank you much. All right. Who's ready to start? Microphone is. <laughs> um, so first of all, before we get going, it's super exciting to have the Northwest Pennsylvania Innovation Beehive here. It's an amazing program. Uh, all four of the universities plus the Blasco Library are part of the Innovation Beehive. It is super cool to be part of that. I can't tell you when I talk to startups not in Erie County, how jealous they are to have a program like the Innovation Beehive. So to all of the universities and all of the folks here from the Innovation Beehive, thank you very much for all you're doing. So do you know how disgusting the bottoms of your shoes are? I mean, they are truly disgusting. And our very first company is from uh, Edinburgh University and they are called Auto Shoe Sanitizer. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Benjamin Kovshinikov and his advisor, Dr. Peter Kovshinikov. Uh, hello, I am Ben, uh, I, sorry, I am Benjamin Kovshinikov. Uh, I am the Enbro team. <laughs> Uh, my mentor is, is Dr. Peter Kshinikov, and as you can probably guess, he is my dad. <laughs> uh, I, and the auto shoe sanitizer is, 
is designed to combat the problem of whenever you would uh, walk around, you would collect germs, bacteria, and other uh, contaminants on the bottoms of your shoes. Uh, my family has 40 or so chickens, and around summertime, uh, the smell and it gets pretty bad, especially when you have to clean out the coop every, I think, three weeks. So, yeah, it gets really, really bad, and all that muck and other stuff gets on the bottom of my boots. And I do take them off before I go into the house, but I realize that that, that many of the sh of our other shoes, they do make it in, in, into the house. It's true that they don't go through the muck, but they do still go into public areas that other people have walked through, which that is a widespread spread of germs. And, and in those public areas, germs can spread, like in the case when I went to Splash Lagoon, uh, uh, most people walk around there barefoot because there's water ev everywhere. I actually contracted planter's warts there a couple of years ago. So that was actually one of the main inspirations for this idea. Uh, because you can spread those germs to your home, workplace, your place of school, or, or just any place of comfort or, or uh, restaurant. Uh, what it is, is that it is a moisture pad that, that has, uh, that has uh, gel, gel, gel pods, uh, uh, in, that has gel pods in, inside it that would hold, hold a, a sanitizing engine inside of it, and then the pad would be attached Uh, to a sl sli slip on pad or board that would slip under, uh, 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 under the floor, 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 floor mat like this, and then attach to it the, the durable Velcro. This way it doesn't slide uh, under your feet and it, it stays on pretty, pretty well. Um, and the benefit of Velcro is that uh, if it's just, you can take it off and then you can run it inside the washer and then dryer whenever you have to clean, clean it. And if you have a luxury car or a vehicle that requires a custom floor, floor mat design, you can just get uh, the, the, the other version of it where it's just the pad and then you can just slip it back on onto there. And, 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 and once it's clean, you would just re reapply the engine via spray, spray bottle. Uh, the ones that will be interested inside buying, buying this product will be people who are concerned about their health, the immune compromised workers in the medical field, as well as farmers, tr truck drivers, and construction workers. Uh, the expertise that I would bring along to my team uh, would be uh, ones involved in packaging to make sure the, the, the design of the package is both practical as well as uh, attractive to, to the eye. Uh, biochemistry, because there are, uh, there are a surprisingly um, a lot, amount of people that do drive barefoot inside the summertime, and so it would have to be safe 
the, the sanitizing agent would have to be safe for direct skin contact. Uh, marketing for, for a good product pla placement, uh, uh, logistics to handle sh shipping, as, as well as business to develop a solid and, and, and long-lasting bi business plan. Uh, a benefit of the product is that it can be um, manufactured in Erie because we have the uh, incredible, because we have a incredible amount of plastic in, in injection molding shops, the, it, it would be easy to find a shop that can produce the matte design as well as uh, we have uh, uh, medical centers that can help out with the safety of the, uh, of the agent. Um, um, we did a cost analysis of the product um, uh, to make the uh, al 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 aluminum mold wood, to make one aluminum mold is $21,300, uh, but, but, the, but the cost of making can sell and then we can sell the full the full package mat included for around $70 and the and, and then just the pad for 50 and 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 to help on shipping costs I uh, I what I would like to do is to partner up with a plastic uh, plastic molding facility such as George Co, so that they can, so that we, so that uh, we can use the drop ship that deal deal that they have with many of their uh, other customers, uh, and and regarding the 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 regarding the supply of the sanitizing agent, um, I thought it would be a good idea to. To do to provide two months worth of sanitizing agent uh, with the package, and then and, and and then the customer can can uh, can apply for a uh, for a monthly sub for a monthly subscription that would cost seven dollars and would be easily charged to to the person's credit card. Uh, uh, the retailers that would be the retailers that this product would be sold at would be Walmart, AutoZone, Advanced Auto Parts, and, and, uh, and, and on Amazon's website, as well as Sam, Sam's Club. Uh, that is the video. Thank that. That is the presentation. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Um, my first question would be, um, I know you talked about retail marketing and, and getting it to the consumer. Have you thought about direct to consumer or even online selling uh, first or what was your kind of thought process behind that? Um, I think it would be good to start out online because that way we won't have to, uh, that, that, that way we can get the uh, orders and we know how much to make that way we don't have a that way we don't have that way we don't produce uh, uh, a, 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 a surplus of, of them 
and then as the product is catching on, we can move on to the major retailers where we can afford to make 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 larger amount. Okay. And the, uh, the other kind of follow-up question is, is there any other products that are out uh, on the market like this? I, I, I have tried finding some. I couldn't fi find any. Uh, the closest that I could find w would be the would be the uh, would be the san would be the sanitizing uh, uh, of floor mats that's being used in hospitals, but those are the full size mats mats that you would walk on into the building and out. Great, thank you. Good job. This is a great job, and I'm really I love this idea. Um, I'm a big shoes off in the house person. <laughs> so this is really exciting for me uh, to think about. Now, I'm looking at your margins, which look really great up there uh, on the screen. So when you're thinking uh, $70, is that just for the driver's side or is that for a pair? Have you considered or are you thinking that your customer is going to buy more than one at a time? Or what's your thought process uh, there? The seventy dollars is just for the single one. One, the idea was that uh, truck drivers. When I first thought oh, 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 of the single package, I was thinking, okay, truck drivers would use this mm -hmm. because they would do the long distance driving. They would stop by a rest stop. They would get out, and then the germs that had collected there would get into their vehicles. And then it would sit there for the entire time that they're driving. They would get out at another rest stop, and then that would just keep building up. So the seventy dollars is just for the same single one. Um, it depends on the profession if or because if you're just a average person that it, that that buys it because you are concerned about your health health uh, uh, you you won't have to change out the agent as often as somebody that would work on a on a uh, livestock farm that would that they would have to constantly exchange it out so so it all depends Um, uh, you can you can generally make as many as you want with just the one mold, but but as uh, it, it, it all, all depends on how uh, much much the uh, products develop uh, and the demand for them I increases. But by then, the 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 cost of a mold, the reward for paying that price would far exceed the, the, the reward would far exceed the co co cost of it because, because if it's being, because if one is sold, just, just like the full mat cost is around, uh, I think it was $70? Yeah, yeah, $70 and so, if it produces uh, 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 100, then 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 right off the bat, that is a third of the price of the original uh, 21 
thousand three hundred dollars, and then that's just one hundred, which a which would take a press. Uh, uh, let's see, it takes around I think it's fifteen seconds to make one one. So 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 it can produce one hundred in less than a week or so. So and 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 so there there is the what I'm trying to say is that within a year it will produce more 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 sorry more mat mat designs molded designs to so that the profit exceeds the cost of the mold So it, it takes 15 seconds to, you know, produce one. What's your, you know, the total number you could produce in a week or a month or a year versus what demand would look like. Yeah. Right. So just thinking about the capacity of one mold will allow you to produce so many. You know, at what point of sales would you need to be thinking about more molds or or more capacity to produce? That's all. Um, Benjamin, nice job. I enjoyed um, seeing your process and, and your idea. Um, just wondering, how are you going to prove out the efficacy of the idea, meaning to show or prove to folks that it works? Um, uh, much, of the, much of the science that goes I, I guess you could call it the science that would go into the 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 mat is already being used in hospitals, as well as the sanitizing agent will it is is already being used when it comes to wiping down work 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 facilities in during that was going on during the height of the pandemic. So most of the ethical uh, uh, hurdles that that I would have to jump have already been jumped by by the major companies and and other health health and safety project product uh, producers. So one of the things you'd have to look at is is there a patent on it um, and can it be. Uh, can it be copied for your purposes? Um, in addition, you have the cost of the mold of 21,300, but I'm guessing you need two different molds for each, each size. So if you had to pick just one to go to market, which one would it be, the full or just the add-on the add one? Uh, it, it would have to be the add-on because because if it's just because if I choose the full, it would be too situational. Whereas with the add-on, it can fit with the standard format as well as any custom. Thank you. Sorry, our online uh, judge had a question as well. So he wanted to have further explanation of how do you use the pad? Does it have to be? Does your feet have to rub? on the pad in order for it to work or is it just placed you know do you have to like when you walk in a house and you dust off your feet before you go in is that the kind of process that it has to work in order to ignite the sanitizing process uh on um, the benefit of uh, a a okay sorry uh a benefit of the uh system if, if it's a extremely simple one uh, uh because it will be be, it will hold the moisture like a sponge will. So you would step onto the mat with both your feet. The pressure would then cause the engine to rise up, making contact with your shoes. And then you just step off of them, uh, which, would, which would remove the pressure, causing the engine to return back into the the back into the pad, and that's it. Great, thank you. Thanks, Ben, thank you.
So in addition to um, the great opportunities to meet folks, and Ben, you're, you're talking with one of the global experts in how to sell stuff to people, Karen Respecki with masonjars.com. So by all means, you've got a, a great level of expertise in this room um, that you should be leveraging for sure. I love collegiate innovation. Um, Brett McCorkle, as he will tell you, innovation is making something out of something that wasn't there before. So congratulations to you, Ben, and, and all that you're doing with your, with your invention. All right, so $1,000. Someone is going to walk away, or a team, is going to walk away with $1,000 tonight. And these four judges, plus John De Silva, who's in Minnesota, will be judging those later. We'll talk a little bit more about what their criteria are. But just remember, it's a thousand bucks and other cool prizes that'll be awarded tonight. But why don't we move on? Did you know that 100% of the streams and waterways in Pennsylvania, 100% of them, are polluted with microplastics? That's pretty sad. It's pretty bad. And this next company is about to do something about it. I'm uh, proud to introduce to you from Gannon University, Damper. And will Colton Rashilla, Jade Clinton, Eric Iwanenko, Kyle Goodman, and their advisor, Dr. Varen Kazanarini, please come up to the stage. Hello everyone, I'm Jade, this is Kyle, and this is Cole and Eric, and today we're going to be telling you about Damper, the device for active microplastics removal. Just for a little background on the problem, microplastics are a pollutant of increasing concern in the Great Lakes watershed. Their size ranges from about 5 millimeters or 3 millimeters, ranges from 3 to 5 to the top, um, down to about 300 microns, which is about the size of an eye of a needle, if you can imagine that. Their size is so small that fish often mistake them for food, so that will result in the bioaccumulation of toxins and plastics within the food chain. And this diagram over here does a really good job at describing that. I think you can see my pointer there. So humans participate in industrial activities and plastic littering, and uh, processes such as UV light from the sun, will um, break down those particles into microplastics, which are then consumed by fish and other aquatic organisms. And then humans participate in fishing activities, which results in the consumption of contaminated fish. Of the Great Lakes, Lake Erie has the highest amount of microplastics, mostly because of the manufacturing close to the shores, as well as the current patterns and uh, wave action that causes larger pieces of plastic to break down into microplastics. And this image over here shows particle counts in Lake Superior, Lake Huron, and Lake Erie. And as you can see right here, uh, in the eastern part of Lake Erie has the highest uh, concentration, which is obviously in close proximity to Erie PA, which will ultimately affect the Erie community. Now introducing damper. So damper can effectively separate and collect plastics ranging from 280 microns to about three millimeters in size from the top of the lake surface to about two feet below the surface. And the parameters of the system can be easily altered if you want to collect specific sizes in the lake. We would like to operate it at night, specifically in the springtime because the population of plankton is much lower at that time of the year, and we want to avoid collecting plankton as best we can. Also, when we deploy, it will depend on the weather conditions at that time. Damper is really easy to use. It's self-cleaning, portable, so it has little to no maintenance. Now Eric will describe 
a video that we took testing in the lab. Sorry. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so this is our prototype in action. As you can see, the water flowing in the top is containing microplastic. We mixed tap water and microplastics that we made in the lab in a bucket, and we then pumped it with a determined flow rate into our clarifier. This flow rate is getting the 300 micron plastic to 3 millimeter plastic up over the, the overflow. And then this is collecting in our filters. And our filters are made with 280 micron mesh. So all of the microplastic in our size parameters are being collected. And Cole will discuss a little bit more about how exactly this works in two slides. Kyle will now present uh, features of damper. So our first feature of damper is that it will be solar powered. This will bring ease to the user since it will be wireless. Uh, it will be a floating structure with an anchor attaching it to the bottom of the lake. It will have internet connectivity to send alerts to the user. These alerts will be read from onboard sensors for clogging and max capacity detection and, and GPS tracking location. It will have a beacon light for visibility. It will be a portable nearshore structure sized at one and a half by one and a half by three and a half feet. And the pre preliminary cost estimate for that size is $1,500 to $2,500. Now, we also have the ability to up our design size for offshore implementation, and that would be upsized to 3 by 3 by 6 feet. Eric will now discuss the uh, product theory. Oh, Cole, I'm sorry. <laughs> So Eric showed you our video in which you saw damper in action and Kyle described to you some of the features, but I just wanted to go into some of the proven engineering theories that we use to develop the damper system. So our system will utilize an upflow clarifier design, which is a method commonly used in wastewater treatment for the separation of particles and sediments from a wastewater stream. The dark blue arrow shown at the center of the graphic uh, helps you to visualize the microplastic laden lake water that will enter our system. Upon entering our system, the flow of the water coupled with the overflow rate over top of the clarifier will help to separate low density plastic particles from the water stream and carry them over the rim of the clarifier as you saw in our video. When those plastic particles raise over the rim of the clarifier, they will be collected in the filter capsules that are shown in our prototype in front of you, and they will be retained within the system while clean lake water will exit the system and re-enter the lake in the same location where it was collected, which is shown by the light blue arrows. So now for some of our marketing benefits. To start, we believe that damper can lead to a cleaner, cleaner bayfront as a whole. We think that this will increase health and well-being of the Bayfront community, and it even may increase residents moving into the area. We also believe that damper can lead to Presque Isle Island clean water promotion. We have many tourists coming in the area going to Presque Isle. We believe that if damper is launched near Presque Isle, it'll show a visual interpretation of how Erie is taking action to clean the water. And lastly, we believe that damper can promote Erie PA's circular economy. We all know that water is a precious resource and we need to do everything in our power to ensure water is staying clean. Now I would like to discuss some of the potential customers that we see purchasing this product. Obviously our product is a little bit higher on the expense scale than some of the others that are being demonstrated today. But we believe that organizations that are interested in the environment, such as Trek at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center, or the Sons of Lake Erie, which are, stands for Save Our Native Species, would be extremely interested in purchasing our product to help to clean up the lake that they hold so dear. Other nonprofits may also be interested in this device, such as Save Our West Bayfront, as it has direct impacts on cleaning up litter and microplastics along the Bayfront community. 
Research groups such as the Sea Grant Program, which is also located at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center, may be interested in our product because it, we have the capability to customize it to add nitrate and phosphate sensors, temperature sensors, or even pH sensors that will allow them to conduct valuable water quality research while the system is in use. Government organizations such as the Army Corps of Engineers or United States Coast Guard may be interested in purchasing our product to deploy within the harbors that fall within their jurisdiction. Microplastics often accumulate within harbors because the current pattern is in such a way that the particles are likely to collect there and a lot of litter tends to collect in harbors. So for the marketing of our product, we plan to do public outreach to spread awareness of microplastics and our solution to that problem. We plan to partner with Gannon since that's where our product originates. We would like to demonstrate the visual implementation of our product on social media. And lastly, we would be promoting a green initiative to explain our efforts on improving the environment. For some expertise required, starting out we would need a business professional. And by this we mean we need someone with an entrepreneurial background that has an organizational skill in making damper an actual business. Next we would need a marketing, marketing personnel. Kyle mentioned we want to get in on social media, but we also want to get on other platforms and explain how damper actually works. And lastly, we would need manufacturing and supply chain management personnel. We need someone that knows how to get damper to, to production and get it out um, to people who would, would need it. Moving into the feasibility of our design, we truly believe that this product ha will be successful with consumers within the Great Lakes watershed and beyond. As you can see, we have a functional prototype of our clarifier ready to test and to add to a buoy system when we receive the funding available to help in the construction. We also believe that a final product could easily be created thanks to, as was previously mentioned, the plastics manufacturers in Erie that could allow us to injection mold the design that you see in front of you, and some aluminum manufacturers who would be able to help us to construct our buoy in a way that would be deployable to the market. The primary outcome of our design is to improve overall water quality, and you truly cannot put a price on clean water. So we believe that there will be millions of potential customers who would be interested in cleaning up the waterways in an area near them. And just to wrap everything up, this is the final product. This is our prototype. Um, anyone is more than welcome to come take a look at it if they want. To the right, as you can see, that is our 280 micron mesh. This was a 15 minute time interval that we filtered water in our lab and that's some of the man-made microplastic that we collected in our lab. Um, and then we'd also like to thank Dr. K, Dr. Casarini. He was a great help in this whole project, so thank you. And then, any questions? Great job. Um, I had a quick question. How long does the product last before it needs to be replaced? So, in general, um, our product should, we're intending to make it extremely durable, so it'll be most likely injection molded plastic surrounded by an aluminum caging on our buoy. So, the filter system as a whole should last for the lifetime of any user. Our filter capsules are going to be replaceable and able to be cleaned. We believe that those filter capsules, according to our lab tests, should take approximately two to three months to fill up entirely in the environment. So they would need to be replaced at that time, but those filter capsules can then be cleaned and reused. So we believe this will be an extremely long-lasting product that would be a one-time purchase for any organization. Okay. And I guess a follow-up question is, does the sun accelerate the, de the deterioration of that, um, being that it was tested inside and, you know, without that, does that, does that affect the product any? So in general, when we're choosing the final material for our product, we will have some flexibility over that. So we would be looking for a material that would stand up to the test of time because obviously we know that the elements in Lake Erie can be pretty extreme. So we would be looking for materials that would be built to withstand those elements. Okay, great, thank you. Um, John DeSilva online has some uh, questions for you all. 
Um, he says, how do you avoid collecting things that are not plastics? So in our initial inlet for our filter um, and our pump, we're actually going to have a preliminary filter. So that's going to be around the five millimeter mark. So we'll only collect the anything less than five millimeters in our in our actual product. Um, as for algae, we're trying to go in the spring so there's less algae so that doesn't back up the the filters. And then anything larger than the five millimeters will, will not actually enter the, the product. So that'll that'll Okay, and uh, another question from him was, what's the capacity of each device? Um, so our initial lab tests are showing that we could pr produce um, probably 10 to 12 kilograms of plastic um, within those filters. Um, microplastics are pretty small and not very dense, but we will be able to collect a lot of them. And our pump currently runs at a rate of about 15 gallons per minute. So that will be the filter capacity of each individual unit. Okay. Uh, another question he had was, how many devices do you need to operate? Uh, and how long do they need to be running to make a difference? So that's going to greatly depend on what body of water you're cleaning up. But um, just to keep it local within Presque Isle, we would estimate that you would need approximately 100 units running for most likely a month or so to have a discernible impact on microplastic pollution, but one unit will be able to make a difference and you will remove plastics from the waterways. Hi, uh, really interesting concept here. Um, along the lines of capacity still, and I, I, I was going to ask the same thing, how many are you going to need to actually move the needle? Um, because I know you were talking about doing this only in the spring. Is this something that, you know, um, that makes a, lo a long-term impact, you know, if you can only do this at, during one season? Uh, and if you need 100 of them to do that, I guess the second part of my question is, do you have any idea what that costs? So the way that micro, the, well, the way that the water flows in the Great Lakes, it all kind of ends up in Erie. So it's really, you can't really say how many you need to be precise because the plastics are constantly accumulating in, in Lake Erie and larger plastics are always breaking down. So it's really how we want to make a difference in decreasing the amount of microplastics that are already there. And then the second part was cost, if you have any ideas, that, if you've worked out any kind of costs for that. We, we honestly have not done that yet. Okay. Right, uh, nice job. I, it, the problem you're trying to solve, uh, ambitious, and necessary. So thank you for taking on that challenge. Um, it, there's a, you know, a, a few things that came to mind for me. One, it sounded like there was connectivity and a pump, and I'm guessing that means a motor. You said solar, uh, but you want them to run at night. There would have to be a battery. Are there other environmental concerns that you're introducing by having electronics operating out in the water like that and what it would take to keep those safe? So Kyle has been, he's our electrical engineer, he's been very strategic about choosing components that are generally environmentally friendly, and we're looking at battery systems that are not your traditional lead-acid batteries that if they were to rupture would uh, contribute contaminants to the environment. And any electronics components that we will be using will be sealed within a waterproof casing, so they shouldn't be exposed to the elements in any way. So we're trying to create a self-contained unit for our electronic systems that will prevent any cross-contamination back into the environment. Awesome, awesome, glad, glad you're thinking about it. That's, you know, the last thing you wanna do is then, you know, try and solve one problem and cause another at the same time. Um, you mentioned uh, a number of, you know, co potential customer groups, you know, local groups you even had in mind. I think it's great that you've identified some. Have you talked to any? Since our product is in such the beginning stages of development, we have shown this product off at other Gannon functions. Um, we attended the um, annual research science consortium out at the Trek Center last fall, and there was a lot of interest in the design at that time. However, we didn't have a deliverable prototype, so there wasn't much that we could do. So we believe that there is definitely some significant community interest, but until we have the funds necessary to 
deliver a working prototype that could be tested for functionality and shown to consumer groups, we haven't really approached them yet. All right, I, oh, I got really loud. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, even if you're early, the sooner you can talk to customers, the people who you think are gonna want this and they can influence the design, do it. Um, and so, I, and the reason I mentioned those local groups, if you need contacts, if you need to, you know, okay, who do, how do we reach out to those groups or who do we talk to? I think you got a, a room full of people that would know how to, how to talk to those exact people. Thank you. Yeah, I think most of my questions were um, already answered, but I, I would second that. Um, there's um, a, a group that's creating a probably the supposedly the world's biggest plastics recycling plant uh, supposedly coming here. So that's Plastec and I know even your insurance is involved in that somewhat. Plastec and the different plastics producers I think would be really great people to immediately start talking with. Not only because you, you need to have this molded, but obviously they're the producers of the, I don't want to say cause the problem, but you know, they're the ones producing plastic that is is ending up in our waterways and and I also know that they're also passionate about the issue so it seems like that would be a really great place to start and um, and see if there's goals out there um, what is an acceptable level like you showed the map and and I didn't realize Erie when you when you show those numbers it makes a real impact and when you look at Erie it's it's bad right what is that acceptable level and then what would it take to get to that acceptable level? How many units running how often? How, how long would it take and how much money? And build, your, build the goal and then the strategy and, and get the folks behind it. And I, I think you, um, this is a big issue and it's awesome that you guys are working on uh, such an important project. And just to address your point, um, we have looked at potentially partnering with a plastics recycler or plastics manufacturer, because obviously when we clean these systems, they will have microplastic particles that will probably have bags and bags of microplastic particles that we could potentially ship to a plastics recycler so that those plastics can be recycled. And to address your point of moving forward with making a difference and making an impact, at this time, there isn't necessarily a quote unquote acceptable level that has been developed by any government organization because microplastics are considered an emerging pollutant and they have very little research has been conducted on them. However, we believe that this system coupled with a strategic effort to reduce plastic littering and contamination into waterways in the first place could definitely make a real difference in removing the residual that already exists within the waterways and cleaning up any additional, but hopefully the additional part would be minimal if our marketing campaigns were successful and we partnered with producers and uh, waste management organizations to prevent that plastic from entering the waterways in the first place. So in addition to the $1,000 that the first place team will get, everyone will walk away with some money tonight, the presenting teams will. In addition, um, they will also get, the, the winning team will get six months free residence at the Gannon Erie Technology Incubator, thanks to Brad and Kathleen and Corinna and Walter and all of the folks at Gannon who are supporting entrepreneurism within our community. In addition, they'll get four hours of consulting from Dr. Kovshinikov, who will help them with their financing and uh, financial planning. Plus, all of the teams get an hour's consult with John De Silva, um, the preeminent IP attorney, certainly in Northwest PA, but definitely in the region. So, the question comes up then, with all of those people getting all of these prizes, maybe you'd like to play at home. So here's how our judges are grading our companies tonight. So 
First, what is the problem and the need, and did they clearly identify that? Next, who's the target customer, and is it obvious that that target customer would be interested in the product or the service? Finally, what is the product or the service? What's the description of what they're doing, and is that obvious? Do they have visual aids like our first two presenters did? Do they have a go-to-market strategy that makes sense, that will actually penetrate into that market and capture that, uh, those customers? And finally, how'd they present? Were they confident? Were they clear? Do they have good visuals and graphics? Those are nice and clean up there. So those are the things that we are, our judges are, um, looking to evaluate our companies tonight. So you can think of what the judges are doing as almost like crowdsourcing, right? Like they're gonna get together here in a little bit and they're going to talk about all of those things that I just mentioned. And crowdsourcing is a really great way of figuring stuff out. I know in all of the uh, startups that I get to work with every day, they have smart people around them and they crowdsource information from the community and customers and other people as well. So as long as I don't mess that up. Um, so we have a team here from Mercyhurst University that is tapping into the crowd. I'll tell you a little bit more about crowd in is Brenton Muir from crowd in. Brenton, come take the stage. transition. That was sold. He really is a professional. So hi everyone. My name is Brenton Muir. I'm from OCS University. I'm currently a junior. I'm studying data science and intelligence studies. Today I would like to talk to you a little bit about a mobile crowdsourced information platform that we've aptly named Crowdin. Do you feel like you've lost a bit of faith in some of the major news sources like CNN, MSNBC and Fox News? Does their reporting always seem to have sources that fit their narrative, bend to their agenda? Have you started to question the reliability of the American mass media system? There is a gross quantity of information and reporting available to the public. And it's increasingly difficult to find out what's relevant, timely, and even trustworthy in many times. That's because the information being provided to the average American is often conflicting, worded in a confusing manner, or it's difficult to digest. See, it's not just you and I that might have this opinion. In Gallup's study of America's trust in mass media, it was recorded at the lowest level since 2016, just last year, and the second lowest level since Gallup began bi-yearly reporting in 1997. When asked, how much trust and confidence the average American had in the mass media when it came to reporting the news fully, accurately, and fairly. Only a third of surveyed Americans indicated they had a great deal or even a fair amount of trust in mass media. See, that's the gap in the market that Crowdin is looking to address. So, Crowdin will be a platform where users can contribute information like text, pictures, and data to local data streams and have access to those data streams related to any location, topic, or sector they might like. Crowdin will also serve as a source of finished products, dynamically developed from local curated data streams into digestible, all-encompassing reports. To achieve this, Crowdin has three major sections of how it works. Contributors are to any user that has timely information that they'd like to contribute. Consumers and clients, who are the general digesters of crowd in, uh, information. And analysts, who are the in-house crowd in experts who will be creating these reports for the consumers and clients from the information provided by those contributors. So this slide's gonna work to give you a visual represent re representation of how crowd in works, and I'll kind of step you through it. So, contributors can send raw information into the Firehose database kind of like a tweet in a way. This information will have a geotag associated with it, so a location, and it will have a category and subcategory if relevant. Then that data will be sent out to consumers, 
that might be subscribed to a category or subcategory in a close location or if it's news relevant enough to be given to every user. And it will also be sent to a sentiment analysis engine, which is essentially a computer that tries to understand the meaning of words. This AI engine will take that data, flag any of it that it, it determines to be breaking the terms of service, is eliciting content, or it's misusing the platform, and send that to the crowd and investigation cell. This cell will essentially determine whether that information should be passed on to necessary authorities or housed on the platform at all. What that analysis engine will also do is send that data to crowd and analysts with a reliability and a relevance score. Analysts will then curate reports based on location or topic and send them to our product database. Products will then be made available to consumers and any paid products or surveys will be made available to clientele. So one of the major issues we might have with this fire hose of data is that, yeah, some of the data might not be legitimate. And part of the user agreement is that we're going to be willing to educate users that, yes, not everything that comes from this fire hose might be legal, legitimate, or even information at all. To help remedy the platform from much of those instances, we'll also integrate a reporting structure, which will help consumers and the crowd investigation cell self-audit and keep the fire hose as clean and applicable as possible. So this next slide is going to work to kind of give you examples of the three major user interfaces that you would see on the crowding platform. First, this is going to be the general or the natural home screen when you first open up the app. You're going to be scrolling through reports or tidbits of information that are relevant to your area under your subscriber list of topics or significant enough in regional, national, or international importance to be shown to you. This next photo is going to describe how report writing might look for contributors to the platform. And the rightmost photo is an example of how you might view the fire hose of information when searching in an area setting. So as you can see, Crowdon will serve consumers as a source of information that comes directly from people just like that. Instead of what feels like top-down reporting from largely impersonal organizations, Crowdon will be providing access to information from user to user with no interpretation, muddling of words, or interference at all. Crowdon will provide credibility ratings on information reports and will work to be the primary fact-checking source for all consumers. So where's our advantage? Well. Our advantage is that we're not going to obscure or misrepresent our sources of information. Those sources are going to be accessible by all individuals on the platform, and that's going to come through that fire hose of information. The reports produced by our internal analysts won't be dependent on information they have to go find for themselves. It all comes from internal contributor data. In comparison, sources of mass media tend to remain unknown, and often go unmentioned. Furthermore, news networks are so focused on national level news and bending things to fit their political agenda that they lose sight of local and regional information that is honestly so incredible to those communities and so important. So how do we take it to market? Well, first, we house crowd in on a local server here in Erie and we target the Erie market. When popularity increases, we move to a housing on a cloud server like Amazon Web Services, and we scale the application to the entirety of PA. After an increase in revenue streams, we scale it to the tri-state area of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New York, and then we also implement a secondary AI center analysis capability to kind of curate and pre-process some of the data. Once we go global, we'll also integrate capabilities for language translations. So the market that Crowdin is targeting is surprisingly still growing. As you can see on this slide, this represents CNN, Fox, and MSNBC's revenue from 2006 up until 2020. On an average between the three companies, they've seen roughly 6 to 7% annual revenue increase. 
So to find revenue within that industry, Crowdin plans to target three main revenue streams. Paid advertisements, finished products, and a survey service. Of these three streams, we anticipate paid ads being our largest revenue stream, and as a close comparison, Twitter has roughly 90% of their ad revenue being their entire revenue. <laughs> Without getting too far into the nitty gritty of the numbers, proposed on the screen are kind of industry average prices, and that's what we project that we will give, uh, th that's the price offering, sorry, that we would give to our clients and advertisers. The social media market is already valued exceptionally highly, and the cumulative annual growth rate for the next five years is a high 15.6%. With only 60% of the world population using the internet, this market still has a lot of room to grow. The bottom right of this slide shows our projections of growth once the platform is fully developed and after the first local case study. In the first year, we're aiming for just 0.01% of revenue from the market, which is roughly $7 million. And by year four, we're looking to have a stake much closer to 1%, equating to about $700 million. So I'll leave you with this, and this is our ask. We're looking to bring on expertise and user interface and user experience, legal guidance to help us understand and pursue the appropriate legal targets, seed funding to help operations expenses, mentors to point us in the right direction and avoid common business mistakes, and marketing support to get our product in front of the right people at the right time and in the right light. So I do appreciate your kind attention I'll now take any questions you might have. Great job, Britton. Thanks. My question, uh, or I have a couple questions. So how do you um, undo the inherent bias that you will see uh, in your AI as well as uh, the curators? Sure. So I'll address that in two parts. Firstly, for the AI side of it, uh, that's my background personally. I'm in machine learning, I understand AI. You're right, there is an inherent bias because really it's the data that you put in that's gonna give you the appropriate data that comes out. And really our biggest focus is gonna be on that data. And before we can have an appropriate product, we need to really curate and take unbiased data as best we can. The second part of that question is about, I guess, the in-house analysts, right? The difference between us and a lot of major news networks is where we would look for our talent from. We're not gonna go and address and poach people from CNN and other news networks and maybe local places. We wanna poach from you know, programs like the Most US Intelligence Program, you know, James Madison, these places that are developing intelligence analysts who might not necessarily wanna go into the government, but they still wanna work in kind of an intel setting. Those people are trained on understanding information and giving an unbiased and appropriate outlook that is just what's actually happening. So that's the plan. Thank you. Um, I guess a follow-up would be, um, you know, a, a lot of times we'll see a lot of people are getting their news and their information from social media. I mean, I can go to social media now and see what's happening before, you know, Channel 12 is there. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I, I can see the downside of something happening and someone's walking and they see a bad car accident and then now they take the picture and now that's somebody's family member that they've never you know they, they've seen something really bad through that so have you thought about kind of the downsides of having kind of the the uh local reporter being just a regular person uh, and and what that kind of ramifications would be yeah absolutely i think there's probably a lot of insensitivity that you could see coming to the app from people that think they're doing the right thing and presenting the right information. And then if it hits the right people and certain people, it's really just not the same in those eyes. So one of the things that we've considered and would anticipate uh, involving in the application is an image recognition thing. To try and avoid any scenes of gore, anything that's necessarily going to be jarring to the viewer. Because realistically, yes, sometimes the photos are appropriate. But in a general sense, we would prefer those photos are curated by our in-house analysts before they're given to the clients. So if we do see an issue with that, it's as simple as just being able to take away the ability to have photos posted on the platform, but to still give us those photos in-house. Okay, um, John DeSilva has a question online. He says, 
Uh, could you please elaborate on who is the target customer and is this an end user or is this a platform? Sure. So just to preface that, I'm going to ask for clarification on the second part of that question just to kind of better understand that. So if he wants to know that and give me clarification, I'd really appreciate that. Um, but for the first part of, I guess, who our users would be, realistically, we're looking to target those people between the ages of 18 plus, maybe 18 to 55 is a common demographic between mobile users and people that really want just truthful information. We're probably also looking at getting slightly left-leaning or slightly right-leaning or very moderate people that are really just looking for the truth of a situation to better understand what's going on around them, not necessarily looking for information that fits their already internal biases. Uh, in terms of the second question, I'm not actually particularly sure what that's asking, so. Yeah, he said, um, is this an independent news uh, platform and who are you, um, I'm sorry, but there's another message coming through. He <laughs> says, uh, uh, is it a subscription model? Would it be attached to CNN, uh, Fox? Uh, how do you look at how you're gonna be getting paid? So. I can't project where this would go because yes, look, someone could attempt to buy us out and someone could buy us out. And the way that my partner and I have thought about this is that realistically, we just want this being done by someone. They can monetize it however they might like, but if we keep onto it and we hold onto it, our projection is that it's gonna be entirely free for people to use as an application that we would want. But yes, you could definitely attach it to something else. You could see a Reuters buying it on an Associated Press, or yeah, CNN. But as long as someone is doing this and someone is taking unbiased information and presenting it to people, that's really our ultimate goal. Okay, this is really, um, this is a cool idea. Uh, and you're right. There's all these different news places, right? And they all come in and they all tell you something different. Um, and I understand that you're going to have an AI and you're also going to have other people looking at this to vet the news that's coming through. But as soon as you start taking advertising, doesn't that affect the type of news that you're going to be? I mean, unless you're going to go with uh, an NPR kind of model, which I didn't see anywhere on your screen, but I mean, something sure. like that, that doesn't take advertising per se. Um, I, I, how you know? How are you going? To, how are you going to get paid? Just like John asked, I guess. How how do you plan on this being monetized and, and that, that's fair. self sustaining? That's that's a good question. And and to be fair, that's a genuine issue that does come from a lot of advertisers. Um, just, just for an example, I've seen on the CNN website advertising for Fox News. Like it's just not something that is really relative to us. So yeah, unfortunately, with a lot of advertising and a lot of uh, platforms that host advertising services, there is issues. So at first, we anticipate using something like Google AdSense, where you can kind of semi-control what type of advertisers can use your platform to attempt to try and limit it to some of my peers' products that are advertising things and not necessarily ideas. And then as we go through things, the intention would be to, if we could get to a scale that's quite large, kind of produce advertising in-house or have advertising come from internally vetted things. So that instead of having to rely on what is really just a Google algorithm, we would like to kind of manually review the set of advertisements that we could have on the platform. But you're totally right, it's such a complex issue. Thank you. Okay, uh, very, very nice job. This is, um, so this is interesting to me for a, a couple of reasons. One, what you're talking about is, is building a platform, right? And that's a relatively new uh, type of business model that not a lot of people recognize owning and controlling a platform uh, it is significant. Think about uh, Apple's App Store, right? They own the platform, they don't own any of the apps, or maybe a few of them. Um, so some of the largest companies in the world right now own and operate platforms, not you know, selling a product like you traditionally think about it. So sure. I, you're very forward thinking in in, uh, in, 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 in tackling a you know, particularly dicey area. So this is um, uh, probably gonna be a lot of questions about monetization. How do you m remain altruistic in your mission and not be tempted to satisfy shareholders and all, all, all sorts of things like that uh, that you're gonna need to dig into. 
And I appreciate that you have an ask here of, of like, hey, these are the things that we're gonna need to make this successful. Um, have, have you prototyped, have you built anything to like test out and see how could this work even in really low fidelity ways of like everything's manual, somebody's gonna create a piece of content, somebody's gonna review it, somebody's gonna consume it. What, what does that look like? So crazily there's about 12 answers to that question which is kind of funny. Um, but to answer I guess the side of have we actually addressed this at all or have we taken this to anyone? Yes, so internally, uh, we've queried this to a lot of Mercia students to ask about the relevancy and you know how they might see this fit in their lives. Um, and generally, it's been a pretty well accepted, like pretty good response. The other side of things is, um, previously, in my background, I worked on sentiment analysis for a government contractor. And we did very, very similar things to having an AI understand tweets. It, it was just tweets for that company. So I, on the side, unbeknownst to anyone, kind of went along my own way and tried to build a model that understood, um, I guess, the meaning behind things, very similar to how you might see Google Translate, what it's actually saying, and the reliability of how that's being said. So we have the engine kind of relatively built, but that's the most fleshed out part. I have no experience in app development. That's just not my criteria. Um, but thankfully in the community, we have the Penn State Beehive who are fantastic at the user experience and the user interface. They have a great app development team. Um, and that's where we'll be looking for that. So I'm not sure if that entirely answers your question, but I'm hoping it does. No, it, thank you, that helps us understand this new legwork you've done already. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Yeah, your um, presentation was very professional. You did a, a really good job. It's a, an extremely complicated issue that we're all you know scratching our heads over wondering who's going to come up with this solution because it's it's a big problem and it's going to impact you know gener generations a um, couple thoughts that i have is i don't think people are so altruistic that they're going to contribute information without bias either without incentive or within with with their own filter um, so that's one. And then secondly, I think it's, it's a similar, similar question. How can you, how can you vet this w with an MVP, right? The minimum viable product, how do you, how can you start? Because there's already a hose. The fire hose is there. Sure. You don't have to create the fire hose. It's already there. And so can you put something in place that, that can start that process and, um, very much crowd in, right? You should easily be able to kind of crowdsource some help with that. But super interesting project, and I wish you the best of luck. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, I think we know it's an extremely complex issue. I think we all want to find out the solution. And, and genuinely, the goal of this is to just have someone figure out the solution. Obviously, I would love it to be me. It'd be a great time, it'd be fun. But that's very hopeful, right? Um, I guess kind of to address your two points and maybe combine them a little bit um, and kind of touch again on where we would look to get our talent from. We don't want users to mask their identity and change their own internal biases. That's, you can never ask that of someone and we don't want to ask that of someone. I don't mind if Karen from down the street wants to post something about a dog being that. I don't care. But the point is that through the sentiment analysis engine, those people in-house can take the reliability of that information, which might be super high for that dog being loud, but the relevance of the information, which it might be super low, and assess, okay, is this really usable in a report? No, probably not, don't use it. But when they find things that are reliable and relevant, be able to combine those, give that to a user, and also have that report be attached back to where they got that information from. I could never ask everyone to be altruistic. I couldn't even ask myself to be altruistic, but I really hope that the platform can do something similar to it. Great, thank you very much, Brent. Perfect. So I look at Brenton's closing slide and all five of these things are literally in this room. Uh, John De Silva, who is on the 
the Zoom, I guess, um, can provide legal gu guidance on copyright and patenting. And of course, that's part of the prize package that gets awarded to all of the teams that are participating here. We have folks that can provide seed funding and business mentorship and all kinds of things right here in this room and certainly within our community. So for those of you entrepreneurs and those of you who are thinking about what's next, recognize that Erie is a great place to bring your passions, bring your business, get the guidance and support that you need to really launch. Speaking of which, our next presenter is solving the problem that 3D printing holds the promise of, but in reality isn't able to do until now with advanced, is it advanced, right? Additive manufacturing systems. Welcome to the stage, please, Michael Gibaltara. Mike? I'm Michael Gibaltera, founder and CEO of Additive Manufacturing Systems. Before we actually start talking a bit about today, uh, the first thing we're going to look at is a little background. Uh, so for the, we're talking about 3D printers, and specifically 3D printers that use filament, like the wires of plastics. Um, pretty ubiquitous, hopefully we've all seen those things. The other big thing we're talking about is a material called PEEK, P-E-E-K. Uh, -E -E uh, it's a super strong, super durable, chemically resistant material, uh, but it's really expensive and difficult to process. And it's kind of considered for 3D printing the gold standards. If you can 3D print peak, you can 3D print pretty much anything. The big problem that we have with 3D printing right now is the lack of characterization. What is characterization? Well, it's the combination of your structure, your properties, your performance, and your processing. You combine all those together, and you get what's called the characterization for the material. Change one of the processes, or you change how hot the temperature is, how fast you print it, or the design of the part, you affect the characterization. When you talk about characterizations, for injection molding or thermal forming or existing ones, you have a truckload of those existing right now. This is for one material for one process, and this is just a table of contents. When you look at 3D printing, you're looking at lists like this. This is a bit of hyperbole, but in reality, a lot of the data that does exist isn't good science. There's a lot of, yeah, I 3D printed this material once, we tested it, it was, we got these results. If you tried to repeat these tests, you would get different numbers. That doesn't work for industry. Specifically, industries like the aerospace, automotive, medical, research, and energy production. For Boeing, if you told them, hey, every time you 3D print a part and put it on an airplane, it's gonna behave different, that's not gonna work. <laughs> would you like to fly on that airplane? For medical, we're talking about parts that this material is strong enough, it's the same density to strength ratio as human bone. And we're talking about for hip replacements, you can now 3D print the part, you can 3D print, say, your hip, that is just as strong and the exact same shape as what's coming out. This means that this part will last longer than you. Um, for energy production, green energy is a huge part of what the future is. Wind turbines, they're trying to squeeze out every little percentage of efficiency because that means it's one less windmill that they need to produce. Well, 3D printing, and specifically PEAK, is, huge, is used heavily in this process. So what's the kind of solution we're looking at here? We need a standardized platform that can be used as a test flight, so something that you can just test parts and figure out how does this characterization happen. You need software that's going to take all this data that you're going to generate and actually make it usable. And then you need materials that are optimized for the 3D printing process. So the first thing that we're currently working on is the high temperature thermoplastic system, or for you internet nerds, HTTPS, which is just a robust platform that's designed to be adapted. You want to use filament? Awesome. You want to use pellets, which are the raw materials? Awesome. You can do that. We have designs to meet those needs. High precision repeatability. That means if you print one part, five parts, 100 parts, they're the same. That way when you test them, you get the same results. And one of the big things for us is more features at a lower cost than the competition. This all gets put into our software that we're gonna be developing. Specifically, we're developing is called a slicing software. This takes the 3D model you see on the left there, and it cuts it up into thin, thin little layers. 
That then takes that information, tells your 3D printer, hey, do this, do that. And eventually, you get a 3D printed part. So the big thing is we're trying to develop intelligent software that helps the user. So we sit there and say, hey, I'm an engineer. I designed this part. I need it so the forces are coming at the very tip of that part, and it's being supported in the bottom. Well, the software automatically customizes its settings based on what you need. Then we can have a hands-on, hands-off operation. We all know it's really frustrating when software tells you, no, you can't do something, but doesn't know why. We want to make sure that you can sit there and say, I know better than you. And the big thing for us is also software as a service. The slicing software, this, when you buy one of our 3D printers, it comes free. However, the database that we're going to be creating, that will be a service that you can purchase onto. Next, we have filament. Once you take those two first problems, solve them and you get them down pat, you can develop materials that are designed for the process, designed for the needs. I'm Boeing, I need a material that does this performance for this many years in this aircraft. Awesome, we can sell you material that does that. That then also creates for us a nice little printer and ink, ink business model. But for all of us, we have a very big company ethos for us, which is high quality, precision, and reliable products while ensuring they're developed and built locally. This is all while sourcing the majority of our parts locally from small businesses using sustainable practices. Companies like Gene Davis, which have been a huge foundation for metals in Erie. How we're getting this into market? Uh, so we're looking at LinkedIn marketing as the first step for us. Taking this, one of those things, if you look at manufacturing on LinkedIn, no matter what industry you're in, 3D printing is on there. The next thing, big thing is trade shows. You're buying an expensive 3D printer, you want to see it first. And lastly, is research projects. The idea for us is that if we can sit there and publish tons of papers, which we know this machine can do, companies get to see this working and see how well it works. Universities get to see this working and see, hey, I can also write a truckload of research papers off of this machine. For us, we have a team right now. We have me, and now we have Matt Rockridge, who's an amazing electrical engineer, uh, who's been really helping a ton with developing the electrical side of things, uh, including working on that. Uh, we're also looking at develop, adding on some software engineers. I've been talking to one so far. We have some more uh, spaces that we're going to be opening up soon. And then we've also been looking at future business partners. I'm an engineer. I'm great at that. I'm not perfect at everything. Business partners are always needed. So where we're at right now, we're developing that first prototype, like I said. We have about two more weeks, we're hoping, to actually have it functioning and working. Uh, and then we're working on the production printers already. We've already been sitting there and saying, what have we learned from the prototype? How can we improve this? And how can we make it easier to manufacture? We're right now working on raising funds just because this is an expensive uh, 3D printer. It's going to take a lot of funds for us to get started and going. And we've already been looking at setting up shop in Knowledge Park. We've been talking to some people on spaces for options, and we're hoping to get up locally running soon. But what we still need is tons of guidance. Like I said, engineer, not a business major. <laughs> need that guidance. I really appreciate having, there's a ton of great people in Erie that I know can help. We need help with trade shows and graphic design. Right now, our current product, if you like silver, awesome. If you don't, can't help you on that one. Um, we also need connections. You know someone at Boeing, you know someone at a hospital that's looking to do research, we would love to talk to them. And we also then, also, lastly, we need that capital. But for our customers, we always like to ask, why us? Why would you choose us? Well, first off, the cost. We're significantly cheaper. You might be going, first off, why would we be cheaper? The reality is we first set off designing this, one, by what's the bare minimum cost that you could do to achieve this. Then we said, if you spend a bit more money, do you get a better feature? And we started adding those up. So that way you get just the expensive parts that you need without wasting a ton of your money. It also helps that by using the software and the filament, we're able to offset our profit margins that we need. But we also want to focus on, you get a quality product for that low price. You also get high customiz customizability for your needs. You need some specific material you need to work with? Awesome, let us know, we'll work with you, and we'll enable that. You also get access to some of the top experts in polymer characterization and additive manufacturing. We guys are wondering, Baron, we have a very small plastics lab there, uh, and the professors have all been working and having a hand in this design. And for us, we're focused on repairability. 
The idea is if you're buying this 3D printer, we don't want to have to sit there and force you to wait for a maintenance technician to come out and we charge you six times what we're paying that technician. We're gonna make it so it's easy for you to fix and we'll help you with that in the process. Or if you're not comfortable, awesome. We will send a technician out, but we're not gonna charge you a crazy exorbitant price for it. Thank you for your time. I really open to questions. Great job, Michael. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, so for the, uh, for the marketing side, are you looking for direct to consumer? Are you looking for retail? What is that? It's uh, very B2B, that's okay. what we're looking for. Okay. Yeah. And then um, this last question for mine is, will the filament be required to um, maintain the durability of the product? Like you said that the, the filament is it's really important in making sure that everything is consistent, yeah. um, but you can use different filaments. So could you kind of expand on that? Yeah, so you can use whatever material you want. That's kind of our goal for this. If you have this material that you have specific requirements of, we'll gladly help you get, source that material, turn it into filament. If you can do it yourself, awesome, do it yourself. This is so far out of my wheelhouse. Um, <laughs> uh, but really cool. So I'm trying to understand that you have competitors that are doing the same type of thing. So what is proprietary about what you're doing? Is it your software? Yes. Is it the machine itself? Because yes. as Catherine just asked you, we don't need to use the exact filament. You can use yep. whatever kind of, of media that you want. Yeah, so the big thing for us is that software. Uh, the 3D printer itself, yes, there's some kind of special design things we've done onto that, but in reality, yes, a company can come up and make a solution around what we're doing. The software, on the other hand, once we get that out there, that will be kind of our bread and butter. Okay. So that's, so it would be adaptable for whatever yeah. company or whatever type of you industry is You have our competitor's 3D printer, awesome. You can purchase our software and we'll happily sell our software to you. You can use that. Uh, or strongly encourage using the best system, which is ours. Of course. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, re really nice job and, and uh, can you know, appreciate the problem you're trying to solve having, uh, I guess I talk too soft. That might be why the, the mic keeps going up. Uh, I can appreciate the problem you're trying to solve having, having worked with these before in the past. But what I found really interesting in, in your presentation, it, it seems like you're focused on, and what I can appreciate is you're focused on the outcome that the customer's after, yeah. right? Not the, the customer isn't looking for a 3D printer or, or looking to 3D print. They're looking for the part that comes out of the 3D printer. They're looking for the consistency. You're trying to solve that problem, the results that they're after. And that's a great orientation. Now, the, the thing that one of the challenges I see is, you know, you have a pretty broad definition of the customer group. You mentioned a lot of different companies and a lot of different potential outputs. And so I guess my question would be, have you honed in on a specific customer you want to start with yeah. to serve the, the specific need and outcome thereafter? Absolutely. So I can actually say, so yes, um, the customers we have been, we've already been reaching out. We've already been talking to several companies. Um, Penn State's have actually been one of the big uh, people that we've been talking with a lot. Uh, so yes, Penn State Baron gets the prototype machine. But Penn State University Park and Penn State Medical have both been extremely interested in this uh, once the prototype's actually functioning. Um, so yeah, I think those two are kind of a really good target for us to start with, and then we'll be springing board off on to all sorts. And, and you, you talked a little bit about cost um, yeah. being lower than competitors. Do, do you have a specific price point? Have you estimated margins? Yeah. So uh, for us, so yeah, we're going to be looking at selling this for $120,000. Okay. Uh, our actual cost to manufacture, including assembly time, is about forty thousand dollars. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, good. Good job on the presentation. Thank you. The um, I was ex super excited to hear about the software and what you're trying to do there. Definitely needed. It's. Um, I think it's an interesting niche to get into. Um, but then when I heard that you're building the hardware, I, I got to wonder why. Yeah, so the reality with is there's no standard right now for testing these materials. 
So this hardware is basically creating the standard. We're creating that gold standard so that we can then put that into software. Yeah, I, um, respectfully, I think that's potentially pretty tough to do. If you had a software that you worked with the middleware that then could go with uh, interface with the most common or most popular or best equipment out there, um, you could probably get product market fit pretty quickly. Um, instead, you're building an Apple, right? You're building the best machine, the best software, the best um, everything, you know, even down to the filament. It, it's a pretty big lift. And um, I, just my feedback is, uh, your comment was software is where it's at. That's what's going to be your differentiator. And it seems if you could s uh, focus on that with existing hardware, you might be able to get there quicker. Yeah, yeah. so I would say this is like, uh, for us, the key thing is a lot of 3D printers that do exist right now, they don't control a lot of their variables very well. So yes, we can get that data right now. We can absolutely get that. But the data is garbage. If the room ch temperature changes, the end result changes. The data changes. So we need to create something that doesn't where care about that. So that way if someone's printing this in California or Erie, their parts are the same. And that's kind of our, the reason why we started with the 3D printer. Yeah, thank you. Great slide. Thank you. Oh. 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 Yeah, we have some questions online, sorry about that. Um, so the question was, can you expand on uh, the char characterization criteria? Yeah, so um, with polymers, they are, can be affected drastically, like 40% in their end results, depending on how the material is processed. You change the print speed, you change the layer height, you change the build plate temperature, you change the build chamber temperature, all of those things can affect your end result. So the goal is to start characterizing when you change this, what happens. And that is how you create a characterization profile, which is what you can use the material. So that way before you even 3D print the part, you know how strong is the part gonna be. Great, and then the follow-up question was, do you have to do a new characterization for every printer out there, or are you only focused on the material? We're really focused on the material, because the material then can be t changed to whatever 3D printer at that point. Uh, but the material is kind of the big variable that we have to really start to solve, which is what we need the machine for. Great, thank you. Great, Michael, thanks. All right, all right, all right. So we're halfway home, so settle in. Just kidding. Multiple people fainted. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask our judges to depart the room, they're gonna go out and, um, well, let's see here. All right, they're gonna go out and they're going to be grading based on the criteria that I provided you earlier. They'll be back in just a little bit. And so thank you very much, judges. Catherine Easterling from Bridgeway Capital, Jen Hoffman from The City, Brett McCorkle from Erie Insurance, and Karen Respecki from MakerPlace and MasonJars.com. Thanks to our judges so far. And John De Silva, um, who may not be in Minnesota. I've just gotten word that he may not be in Minnesota. How about a hand for our judges? Thank you. All right, so the cool thing about the Collegiate Innovation Showcase is that students graduate and they try to go do this thing that they talked about in the showcase and we have two really super interesting companies to share with you tonight coming um, from gannon university are two young men justo hernandez and evan fistler who will share with you about their really intriguing product called glacier scalp cooling gents Thank you, Brian, and thank you for those who are allowing us to uh, present today. So, like, as you said, we are Glacier Scalp Cooling. I am Hussein Hernandez, and this is my partner, Evan Fizzler. So, 
As I said earlier, I'm Hussein Hernandez. I am the CEO of Glacier Scalp Cooling, and I graduated from Gannon University last year in May of 2021 with my biomedical engineering degree. And I was, we, both of us were in a similar position as you guys are currently standing right now. We competed in the Beehive Showcase, and we were the winners of the Beehive Showcase. And once we found out that we, or decided that we're going to move forward and take our senior design idea into a business, uh, I took, we took these steps to really help us prepare for this entrepreneurship journey. So for myself, I enrolled in a entrepreneurship course at my local community college uh, at the ETI. We have the Small Business Development Center, SBDC, and they allow us to attend uh, monthly seminars and webinars to help us progress our business. Uh, also at the ETI, they put on this, uh, this weekly event, Entrepreneurship Week, and there they allow us to hear the local entrepreneurs in Erie County, and we listen to their struggles, their advice, and the journey that they went through to help us learn from their mistakes and really help give us a little bit of direction for our company. And again, uh, Erie Tech Incubator, um, that's where we're currently at now, going on to our next six months, and we're gonna really talk about what they provide for us in upcoming slides. So for us, our business, well, we wanted to provide cancer patients with, who are undergoing chemotherapy a sense of control by providing them with an affordable medical device to help them prevent hair loss. So I'm Evan Fizzler. Um, I graduated last May with my undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering. I'm currently an MBA student at Gannon, and we just finished up classes this weekend. Um, and I have personal uh, family members and friends who have gone through uh, chemotherapy and have experienced the traumatic uh, experiences of chemotherapy treatment. And I think it's very important to provide a solution to their hair loss and their mental health. So our timeline looks like this. Um, I was a junior in spring and I was taking biomedical heat and mass transfer. Um, it was canceled due to COVID, the project. Uh, the project was an ANSYS project with how cooling affects the scalp. Um, so when this was canceled, this translated into our business and idea. I pitched the idea of a portable wearable uh, chemotherapy scalp cooling device to the biomedical professors. I was accepted as a project. I formed a team. Um, three other engineers joined me. Um, during this, we had formed a pro prototype and we won the Beehive Showcase event last year, but it was via Zoom, so this year it's definitely a lot different. Um, from there on, we then entered the Erie Tech Incubator. Uh, we have a mentor team of five or so members. Uh, we are an LLC now. We have filed a provisional patent and have a provisional patent, and we have formed a business plan since being at the ETI from September. Yeah, so how has the ETI helped us in our journey? Uh, this is really applicable to all you guys here today because these resources will be available to you and they've really helped us reach these critical milestones that we just talked about, our business plan, our patent forming as a business. So at the ETI, uh, we have one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, who, I, who I can't thank enough is Brad and Kathy as they've really been coaching us through this entire entrepreneurship journey and really identifying the key steps, uh, the critical milestones for us, and helping us get to where we are now. Um, as well as their one-on-one -on -one coaching, they helped us assemble a mentor team. So they looked at us, as we are two biomedical engineers with uh, his MBA, uh, really identifying where we struggle as a business. And with that information, they assembled a mentor team that's personalized to us to help us with those areas that we struggle in. Um, during our time there, we created a business plan and developed one. Uh, we went through a business plan boot camp where we met with one of our mentors, uh, Kathy. We met with her weekly where she would go through and provide feedback and help us really refine our business plan after we completed our section. Uh, the ETI also offers us professional services. So with that, uh, they mentioned here uh, John DeSilva, who is on the judges. He is intellectual property lawyer. and. He's helped us with our provisional patent, and he's been nothing but great for us, as well as the John Lemus. He is the one who helped us with our formation of our 
LLC, our operating agreement, and those costs that get our EIN. And again, he's also been fantastic for us. Um, the ETI also provides us the ability to connect with the Beehive Network and their resources for us. And the Small Business Development Center, this is a free resource to everybody in the public, but they've been very helpful for us where they helped us refine our business plan. We go to them. They look after, after completing our business plan, they looked over and see what parts needs to be changed, fixed, altered. They helped us with our financial projections. And currently, they're helping us with our business cards. And soon, we're going to use them for our business plan, uh, our business plan, our, our website development. And on top of this, they, like I said mentioned earlier in the pro presentation, is they helped us with, or sorry, they offer uh, monthly and weekly seminars where they can help us develop our business and they look at important things like our financials they look at the what's the one we're going to just recent coming up the osha medical devices pitch deck. the pitch deck presentations and they really help us refine our pitch decks and just our business as a whole and yeah that's all we had um is brian yeah. um i think brian. Um, so, <laughs> we have a functional cooling system, um, it's within a backpack kind of design. Um, we're currently in the process of trying to create our cap mold, um, so it's a specific design due to hair and the structure of flow to provide the most effective cooling on the scalp to protect the hair from falling out from the chemotherapy drugs. So. Uh, we're in the process of a cap, and yeah. I think also to add, sorry, to add on is with the prototype design, we're currently in the customer discovery phase where we're really just going through and identifying the pain points of the customers so that they can help us shape our product to something that they want. We don't want to create something that they're not going to use. So we've been currently conducting personal interviews with cancer survivors just to hear their pain points and what they're struggling with or what they struggled during their journey so that we can take their feedback and implement it into our design. So we're still going through, we still have a long ways to go with our product development, but it's, 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 on, it's moving along uh, slowly, but it's, it's, it's going. Uh, yes. Yeah, certainly. So um, I'm just speaking for myself. Um, I'm not sure if you have yeah, something to add. But the biggest side to me, I think, as an engineer, is thinking with an engineering mindset. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on on the business side of things that I never even knew about or didn't know I didn't know about. In that case, would be like all the, uh, oops, I'm trying to think of a word, way to word it. Uh, the I guess regulations within the medical field to bring that product to the medical field. Uh, there's a lot of things that go behind the, behind the scenes with the insurance on how to billing works with the CPT codes to allow us to bring our product there at an affordable price without them raising that number drastically, not making an affordable device. Um, it's really just the, the business side of this stuff has been the most complicated part for me is really understanding. So I'm just trying to formulate this. There's, there's a, lot, a lot of things that are actually quite difficult for me to understand. That always, always has me thinking. Uh, Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a great point. That's basically what differentiates our, what our pro, how our product differentiates from the current competition is having a 
treatment continuity. So current products are stationary, so they can only be utilized within the infusion center. And the reason why that's a problem is because that limits the amount of time that you're able to practice scalp hypothermia, which is scalp cooling. And by extending the time you can practice scalp hypothermia, it can yield better results. So with our product, we're able to take our scalp cooling system to the infusion center, practice scalp hypothermia there, and then practice that on the way back home. Obviously, you're not driving. Someone's driving you. And then practice in the comfort of your home. And it also gives the option to patients who want to have the privacy or the comfort of their own home. So you can also practice this technique within their own household. And why is that, um, so I clearly get why that's a good thing for the patient. Why is that also a good thing for the facility, the cancer treatment facility, to have a mobile take it home with you type product? Yeah, you bring up an excellent point. And that is, there's two, there's two sides to this, where it increases, it allows them, to, the infusion center, to keep the efficiency within there, so they are able to constantly keep patients coming in and out. That's a, that's a really thing, part, important thing I just learned recently is the efficiency of within the infusion center is very important to them, so when you're going to them, they don't want you to slow down their workflow. So that's one thing, is by it being portable, by taking it there and out, it allows it to be a very efficient process that fits within their system. And the second thing is, which, which is kind of sad we're learning, is just how money motivated the medical industry is. So this gives them another billable item. So it's an incentive for them where they can bill the patient for their treatment, and now they can also bill them for the uh, scalp cooling device. So they're, they're double profiting, I suppose. Yes? So right now, it is not the standard within the industry, but there are some insurance companies that do reimburse the patients. Um, current competitors are in the process of making it the standard where they're working with CPT codes to get them approved for insurance reimbursement. Yes? Yes, that, that, it's uh, the second part where by uh, reducing the blood flow, it reduces the amount of chemotherapy drugs that reaches the hair follicles. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. And um, I would say no matter how each group finishes, I encourage everybody to uh, join the ETI and chase after your entrepreneurial dreams. Thank you guys. It's actually kind of funny. I, I tend to talk very loud, so I'll stand back here. But um, it's funny because I'm always second to Husto and Evan um, if you don't get the inside joke. <laughs> I came in third last year um, here. But we all ended up in the same place, so it worked out. Um, anyway, I'm Mia D'Amato, and I'm the owner and creative director of Boho Basement. So just a little bit about my our brand. And when I say our, we, I mean I. But um, we have a purpose to mitigate textile waste and restore our environment throughout our various practices um, in terms of manufacturing. So what we do, a lot of the hot terms right now are upcycling or reworking. So we take secondhand clothes, um, donated or on consignment, and rework them, so reconstruct them into new garments. So in addition to this, we also sell vintage um, and just like already good items. Um, and this has become increasingly popular over the past few years. But just recently in October, um, I started getting more into the rework side versus the reselling side, which um, was very good to me, but the margins were a little bit higher on the rework stuff, and it's more fun. So um, I really got into that. And people just really liked, I put out a line of NFL 
wares, and people really love that. So over the past six months, that's just what I've been really focused on. Um, we're strictly e-commerce, so we sell, um, we push all of our sales from our socials to our website. Um, and something kind of unique to our way is that we run a drop model, meaning all of our products are sold on one day within a couple hours of a time frame, once a month. Uh, we do smaller drops throughout the week, but essentially you can only buy in a certain amount of time um, whenever we drop the product. So we don't have a running inventory um, and don't take orders openly throughout the course of the work week. Um, so kind of just the theme I chose for just my little 10 minute spiel is why not? I mean, we're all here and doing this. Somebody's going to do your idea. I was just talking to Brian earlier. Somebody's going to do it, and it, why can't it be you, you know? Um, so kind of just backtrack. I'm 23 from Buffalo, New York. I graduated from Mercyhurst last year in 2021. Um, and how I really got into just, I guess, my hunger for on entrepreneurial I don't know, um, endeavors, is just being kind of locked up over the pandemic. So we got sent home, um, and I'm one of five, so we have a house of seven. There's just a lot of people in there, so sometimes it's just, you know, too much. So I would take a lot of walks when we were kind of locked up and just think about where I wanted my life to be in just a couple years um, after graduation, and just like a lot of my peers, what are you, like, what was I going to do, you know? I have this degree, but how am I going to use it? So um, I started just reselling clothes as just a way to kind of make some cash um, and found a really creative, cool community that did the same thing as well. So I initially thought of, this is actually the idea I came to the Beehive with, um, was a tech startup that was a mobile marketplace to host these resellers and reworkers and selling their products. Um, I'm not tech savvy, like I said, I'm a creative director, I have no hand in any of that, and no desire to try to teach myself. So um, I graduated, and there were a lot of things going on, moved away for a little bit, and then I got a call from Kathy, which I kind of think of as my saving grace, and she was like, hey, you know, you didn't win. She didn't say that, but <laughs> she was like, hey, you know, we have some extra space. How would you like to bring your idea back? And I was like, okay, I don't really, I'm not really working on this anymore. But honestly, just having the ambition and motive to try to tackle anything is one step in the right direction. I mean, just even being here tonight, like there's so many people that don't even have the self-motivation to tell themselves that they can even, you know, set aside time to do something that isn't affiliated with school or just separate from, you know, the day-to-day. -day. So um, I got connected with the Beehive, moved here in October, and in January is when my brand really kind of, I guess I call it, like popped off. Um, so it's definitely been a learning experience. I'm still learning and growing every single day, and of course I help with breath, oh, I say breathy, but cat and breathy, I guess that's a new thing, breathy, um, but cat and breathy are awesome, they're always there, I mean, I'll be in, at ETI from 7 a.m. sometimes until 2 a.m., and there's somebody always floating around, it's always great um, to just be in a collaborative work environment with other aspiring entrepreneurs every single day. Um, but yeah, one thing I, I kind of keep with me is that something I've just told myself and just try to communicate to as many people as I can is that it's easier to fail and lose than it is to win. And if you never stop trying, then you can never fail. So I never look at my ideas or honestly anybody's as ever a failure because you're always actively growing and learning and can always pivot. I pivoted three times, you know, and people step back from the outside and they're like, wow, you have a great brand. And on the inside, I'm like, well, <laughs> I had to change it three times and move here and do this. So there's a lot that goes behind the scenes that a lot of people don't appreciate. But as in an environment with other entrepreneurs, they get the vibe. You know, they're in there doing the same thing as you. And it's great to be uplifted every day. Um, 
especially in Erie. I never thought I would move back here, but it's been great so far. Um, also, it is a great space to live as a young graduate. Um, I live downtown now, and there's things popping up every day. I'm like, oh my god, I didn't know that was there. So it's been great to live here, and I can't wait to see, you know, where the connections that ETI has given me, where they take me over the next couple of years. I'm excited. Um, so yeah, should I take questions? Sure. We can okay. Ask questions. I don't know if you're ready. I have one for you, yeah, sure. You said that you sell through e-commerce, mm -hmm. but you don't sell through regular e-commerce. You do something pretty unique and pretty innovative. Can you explain to us what you do? Not only the bid system, but there's another way that you sell through your e-commerce sales. Can you kind of talk about what it is that you do or what you're selling? Yeah, so um, that was kind of just to go into a little bit more on my drop model. Um, you mean, that's what you mean, right? Yeah. yeah so every Thursday, um, I take a few items. So it's anywhere from three to five items is usually the sweet spot to get people kind of excited enough to, you know, want to buy one item. So, sorry, I'm not really explaining this well. Let me backtrack. So I'll make an item the week prior. And then that week on Monday, I'll start posting about it and getting people excited. Um, and then on Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, um, I go on Instagram Live and basically, I don't know, if I was selling this blazer, I'd be like, okay, made this blazer um, all from, you know, sustainably sourced materials, thrifted fabrics. Uh, starting bid is $50. And it'll go for, you know, a few seconds or a few minutes. And then um, usually our margins are a lot higher on those items because people are really eager to like get their hands on it. There's only one of them that will ever exist. So, but um, the way we kind of keep our back end running and maintaining, I guess, our revenue is through our monthly drops where we take um, a select few of custom orders. So we kind of do both, but the weekly Thursday thing kind of allows everyone to be excited about it. Um, and really kind of create engagement for my brand, um, active engagement. Yeah. Again, very successfully handled. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So do you have trouble getting the materials to make the one-of-a-kind items? And then how about returns? If someone sees the blazer, loves it, buys it, doesn't fit right. Yeah, so, yeah, so I've kind of just really focused on developing a community that I'm very transparent with my brand. So the community that develops around, like my followers will tell other followers how it works. So I don't even have to do that. I mean, you just know that when you hop on, this isn't returnable, it's one of a kind. The price you pay, you're locked in. Obviously, there's going to be some problems that of course I'm willing to accommodate and help people out. Um, but 99% of the time, I never have any issues with returned, I mean, with second hand, there's always going to be some flaw or that you're or risk that you're assuming when you're purchasing that product. So, um, yeah, I don't really have that problem. But in terms of obtaining like materials, um, so yes, it's difficult. Um, but trying to figure out, I mean, textile waste is just massive. I mean, there's never going to be a way to just assume all of it. So just getting in contact with um, either manufacturers or wholesalers that sell it in bulk, but the whole idea behind the business is to make stuff from what we get instead of having an idea and looking for fabric to make it. So it's kind of like reverse um, or different than like traditional retail, but um, just trying to manage and mitigate as much, as much textile waste is our main, main goal. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, our judges are back in the room, so that must mean one thing and one thing only. We have a winner. So, judges, is this your unanimous decision? It is. Do we want to poll the jurors? All right. So, our fourth place winner 
who receives an hour of legal counsel on intellectual property issues with John De Silva from MMIIP and a check for four, or maybe it's Venmo, probably Venmo, for $450. Mike Gibalterra from Additive Manufacturing Systems. Mike, come on up. And we're gonna get a picture with all of the com competitors here in just a second. Congratulations, Mike. Our third place winner and $550 along with an hour with John De Silva is Damper. Damper, come to the stage. Congratulations. Congratulations, Damper. All right, well, just like the, um, uh, what is it, the Miss USA pageant, as soon as I say who's second, you'll know who's won. So our second place winner, who also receives an hour of consulting with John De Silva at MMI IP and $750, is auto shoe sanitizer. Which means our grand prize winner of $1,000, six months of free lodging at the Erie Technology Incubator and Party House, and four hours of business and financial account, uh, uh, consulting with Dr. Joe Kovshinikov is Crowd in. Congratulations, Brent Muir from Mercyhurst University. How about a big hand for all of our winners tonight, all of our competitors, and of course our judges, and Kathy Roach and Brad Gleason from the Gannon ETI, along with the other members of our esteemed uh, nation, or excuse me, Northwest Innovation Beehive Network, and of course, Congratulations to all of you, and thank you all for coming. We're going to take a few pictures. Everyone, thanks very much. And we'll see you in one year for next year's Collegiate Innovation Beehive. Congratulations.